Hi, I'm Stephen Downs, and I'm broadcasting from my office today in beautiful East End, Ottawa, where we have snow on the ground. Joy, oh joy. Um, and welcome to the last conversational session in eLearning 3.0 for the year. Um, we have viewer flooding in. Oh, no, now we've got viewers, multiple. Uh, so welcome. Um, I'm pleased to introduce two guests who I've worked with in the past, uh, Yuta Trevoranis and Sylvia Algueras. Uh, why don't you both introduce yourselves briefly, and we'll start with Sylvia. <laughs> Stephen, thank you for inviting me to join this conversation. Um, I'm a teacher, a teacher from a university in Cartagena de Indias in Colombia, and also in, in Spain, in, also in, in a university in Spain. Um, for me, it's really nice to, to talk with you and Yuta here in this conversation. Uh, I really love all these topics uh, related with open education, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Yuta, who will be represented with a dot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about my lack of video. Um, but I, I'm Yuta Trebranos, and um, I'm the director of something called the Inclusive Design Research Center, which became 25 years this year. Uh, and we're currently at OCAD University. For about 16 years, we were at the University of Toronto. I'm also a professor. I began a, a, a program in inclusive design, which tries to radically transform our notions of um, education in more inclusive directions. Um, I've known Stephen for quite some time, oh. early 90s, because we worked together uh, in a Canary-supported um, uh, learning object program way back when. And so we've been talking about these topics and the the place of education and the transformation of education for quite some time. And thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Sylvia and I have also uh, a long history of working together <laughs> on international uh, initiatives where we're looking at how we can collabor collaborate across countries with respect to inclusive education. Well, thank you, Yuta. And now, my most recent interaction with the two of you was uh, with uh, with respect to the, uh, the conference. I, guess it, I don't know if I call it a conference. The event uh, that was held in uh, Medellin earlier on this year, uh, which I found very interesting and engaging. Um, and this is part of your overall social justice repair kit work that you've been doing. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that to begin. Um, sure. Do you want me to begin, uh, Sylvia, and then you can talk about the Colombian um, yes. participation? Yes. Yeah, so the social justice repair kit is a project that's um, been supported by uh, the Oak Foundation. They have a program called Learning Differences, where they're specifically looking at students um, who face barriers to education because they learn differently. And the when they invited us to um, propose a project, um, we decided that rather than focusing on education and looking at the variety of projects that are in this space, uh, one of the areas that has been ignored and where we thought um, we could make uh, a or have some significant impact and learn more about what are the barriers to learning that are faced by students with learning differences was to work with youth who have disengaged from formal education who have either dropped out who find themselves in social safety nets um, and who are um, most vulnerable to a whole bunch of, of um, issues, uh, including um, incarceration, uh, homelessness, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's a, a global pattern that if um, 
an, a young person is no longer engaged in, in school or unable to in, be engaged in school or has been in some way removed from school, um, they're far more vulnerable to, for example, um, we've been working in Lesotho where if you go into the mines and you look at the child laborers in the mines, they tend to be um, children who have uh, learning differences and therefore are no longer engaged in education. And so they're easy to recruit. Uh, if you go to Mexico um, and you talk to kids in the sex trade, uh, they often, uh, there's a much larger representation of kids uh, with learning differences. Similarly, if you go to juvenile justice programs, et cetera. In Colombia, um, one of the phenomena that the guardians have made us aware of is that um, th they are frequently recruited into gangs, forcefully recruited into uh, many of the, the violent actions that happen within the country. So what we wanted to do was to uh, make uh, or support um, social justice youth movements to welcome youth with learning differences. The phenomenon that we had noted with these youth movements was that often when youth, uh, the, the youth with learning differences would be attracted to the youth movements um, because they're fairly cathartic experiences. You can sort of uh, express your anger at the system and do something about the system. But then when the, um, the activities within the youth movements involved more academic skills like open data um, manipulation or communication or writing or any of those things, um, that if there weren't the proper supports, the youth would again feel a sense of failure and disconnect from the youth movement. So they, they're in some ways sort of the last resort for engaging youth again in, in the value of learning and in, in increasing their learning outcomes. So what we, what Social Justice Repair Kit does is it um, provides tools and resources and education and supports uh, so that youth movements can be more welcoming of uh, youth with learning differences. And what we found is that when often when youth are re-enamored of or re-engaged in learning activities, they then choose to also go back into other forms of education. Now let Sylvia talk about Colombia. Sorry that I, I, I talked about part of it. Social Justice Repair Kit uh, is one of, of the most beautiful projects uh, where I have participated. Um, at the beginning of the project, we, we, we thought that one of the most important things we need to understand when uh, we talk about uh, uh, diversity is what means diversity? Mm -hmm. uh, and in Cartagena de Indias, for example, uh, we have a really big problem, and is that the people uh, don't doesn't accept uh, diversity as a value. I mean, uh, we have many problems to recognize the other and how this other person can contribute. Uh, to me to, to be better, but with this person, not, uh, not without the person. I mean, um, so, so for us in, in the project, the first step was to visualize the diversity and why the diversity is important and why the diversity can contribute to us to be a better person. So for this reason, uh, we, the first step for us was to hear the people, uh, to hear the histories, the histories of the people. So uh, we created a space with uh, our our partners in IDRC, Utah, <coughs> and all the beautiful people in in Oca. We created a, a platform called uh, Cuéntalo. I'm going to write here. And in Cuéntalo, the, 
the people from Cartagena, but not only from Cartagena, uh, also from from other cities in in Colombia and towns that are close to Cartagena, uh, have participated uh, sharing the stories of their life. So these stories represents what the diversity means in, in, in our city. And the diversity is represent for all that we are. So for example, uh, in these stories, uh, I represent a young people that, as Jutta said, were in the camps in Cartagena, but now, because the guardians are working so hard with the John in Cartagena, they uh, now have the opportunity to, to, uh, to receive uh, an informal and different open education. I mean, uh, these are the, the guardians. Uh, and and this, uh, this experience with the people permit us to understand uh, what really means to, to be open, to be open to the diversity, to understand what the diversity contribute in our society. And in this way, we are visualizing the value of the diversity, but also uh, we are connecting people because in Cartagena, um, there are many young groups, but they were separate, but now they have a space, a virtual space, uh, and in this space, they, uh, they are in a, in a joint initiative. So, uh, Cuéntalo means uh, in Cartagena, for example, uh, what, what means diversity and what, uh, why is the diversity important uh, in our country? In, over this year, we, we can uh, understand with the John uh, uh, why these uh, spaces are important and why we need to promote this collaboration. In the month of October, uh, the guardians were in Toronto and for they <laughs> mm -hmm. was impressive the experience. They never had traveled to other country. And now this cooperation, this uh, cooperative education have, uh, are producing uh, really nice fruits. For example, the guard, Utah, uh, you don't know this that I'm going to say, but now the guardians are uh, doing uh, seminaries and they are doing uh, uh, in, in the neighborhoods of, of Cartagena, they are working with the people, uh, teaching the people, uh, for example, what means uh, an a smart city, considering the experience that they had in Toronto. So the experience of the guardians in Toronto in October uh, have permit that in a city, 10 years uh, by travel uh, are now, uh, uh, the people are working in, in, in concepts like uh, smart cities. And it was because of the, of the, of the conference um, because of the work we do, we did in Toronto in the Utah's groups. So for this reason, it's important to promote the collaboration between our countries. Uh, uh, it's important to promote this kind of project and it's important to connect the people, to connect the people. I think uh, uh, the, the co co-education platforms that Jutta and Stephen and different colleagues uh, are promoting around the world is the solution for many problems that uh, we have. Um, um, also, is the opportunity to, to share many stories that can help to, 
uh, developed countries to solve also many problems in in the country. So I think it's um, it, this cooperative uh, platform could be uh, really nice to to promote uh, interchange between us and and help us to to solve many problems that we share and um, that they are problems that are real problems around the world. For example, the problem that the guardians, this group uh, face every day is the environmental care. Um, this is a common problem for all of us. So um, for us, social justice repair kit uh, has been a really nice opportunity to learn a lot about the diversity and also to share our experience with with, uh, with the partners and the groups and it's, it's really nice, Steve. So I was looking at, as you were speaking, I was scrolling through the, uh, the stories on the, uh, on the website that you gave us. There's a lot of stories here. And yes. That's recent activities. Um, so these are, are designed and authored by the people themselves, right? Yes, uh, we create a co-creation team. Mm -hmm. So the people uh, are definitely in their places. They are around the, all the calls in the North Coast in, in Colombia, in the Caribbean. So many of these, these stories were recorded in places where there are not internet, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we help the people uh, in editing, for example, the videos or the songs, or, uh, but many of the stories were uh, recorded by the people, but, but we help them to, to edit the story, basically. But the stories are, um, were defined by the main actors that are the young people also, I mean, the, old, the people that participate in this. Yeah, yeah actually this, uh, if, if I can add, one of the, the dilemmas that we've been looking at is the rise of learning analytics and the, the role that learning analytics and data-driven decisions within education plays uh, with respect to students who are not part of the, the sort of normative or average picture. Um, and the, uh, the role also that data-driven decisions make in terms of educational policy, in terms of things like smart cities, et cetera. What happens to small minorities and outliers and individuals that are not captured by the, um, the, the data or when they are captured by the data, they, their needs and their particular interests are outnumbered by um, the majority. So what, what we've been doing is looking at how can we intervene here or what role can we play with respect to that, that whole data sphere. Um, and the, what, what we determined was that one of the ways that we can contribute to the data is not in a, in a quantified way, but in a qualitative way. Because, and so the, the first foray that we made into data was to um, look at storytelling, telling your own story, giving voice to um, the, the the very, very complex and very diverse scenarios that the, these youth face um, to both show that the, the current sort of metrics that we're using to determine value and to determine um, the, the needs or to determine the um, impact and outcomes and all of those sorts of things um, don't capture, in fact, the complexity and diversity of, of the, the situations of these youth. And so the, the storytelling tool and narratives that are authored by the students themselves or the youth themselves um, is what our first focus has been. Yes, and in the same line that Jutta, Jutta is, is talking, uh, in this, in the page of the Guardian, uh, I put there in the chat, Stephen, um, 
we think that we need to close the relation between the citizen and the data. For example, in Cartagena de Indias and in all, in many cities in Colombia, uh, the government collect many data about the environment. But these, these data are uh, frequently uh, underused because they are in, a, in an Excel file and it is not trade. I mean, the, the data is basically just to, uh, just to, just because it's required by the government, but it's not used. So we, we are working with, with the IDRC and the guardians in the generation of this kind of visualization of the environmental data in the city. So then in, in the points, you can, if you, if you, in the points, in this point, <laughs> if, if you if you click on one of the exactly, points yeah. exactly <laughs> you, you can see exactly you can see uh, the components of the water in this specific point so in the plus in the plus in the plus in the blue in the white plus in the white in, in the white plus with blue white you can select Cancel it. Uh, <laughs> I'm very bad at this. <laughs> no, don't worry. In the. I'm out of there here. Okay. Is, is this where you? Okay. Need? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. There. There. In this. In this plus. Yeah. Click. I'm, I'm Click trying, on that. I'm clicking on it, but it's not doing anything. <laughs> I've been trying to it, it won't away. Uh probably something to do with Firefox. Okay, yeah. don't worry, don't worry. And you, I, I think it's also because you're sharing the screen and then there's multiple <laughs> maybe there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the idea, what is the idea? The idea is uh, this this web page now is open to all the citizens in Cartagena. So so the idea is close this relation. I mean, offer this visualization to the to the citizens in Cartagena and show them what is the situation of the environment in mm -hmm. this moment in the city. So you can select different uh, components of the water uh, and and what is happening now. Uh, that is happening now is uh, the guardians, they, they are 2,000 persons in just in Cartagena and uh, they are now in other, in other cities in, in Colombia. They are, they are now working with the people in Cartagena, showing the people this visualization and the people now is understand, oh, our, uh, our water is contaminated. Uh, before the people uh, didn't have this information. So this is open education. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> that is open education means, and this is uh, what this project, Social Justice Repair Keys, keep, is producing in a, in a small city that have many difficulties but we can do this kind of thing and we can, we can uh, permit that the people uh, know these, uh, these data. These data are now open to all the persons that want to, to know about the environment in the city. And we want to extend this to, to, to other countries in, in Colombia. We want, we want to, do, to do that and we, uh, we are. We have done a validation with the with the with many people in in Cartagena, and the and the and the people is now more conscious about that we have a, an environmental problem in the city. So this is open data. This is open education, and 
and this is that we can do together. And the, the other really interesting thing is that it highlights the need for localized data as well. So many of the, the imposed um, metrics or parameters are um, not, don't capture the, the local picture. So the, the participation of environments such as the, the coastal areas of Colombia have highlighted how there are other metrics that are critical and that are, are highly important. So it's not sort of a colonial view of, of what is um, the important data, the important data, especially things like the mangroves and et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a specific, highly um, entangled and culturally entangled biosphere that where there are other um, indicators of the health of the ecosystem that, that are not part of larger global uh, environmental groups. So this, this particular project is helping to stretch those conceptions as well, um, adding bottom-up non-parametric data that, uh, th th that comes from the stories and from the, the narratives uh, from the youth. So what, what are the important things? And um, the, the idea here is that uh, rather than imposing a particular view of a, a, a sought after pattern, data pattern, uh, we're letting the patterns, the important patterns arise from the qualitative data. So it's um, adding additional measures which are more respectful of what is happening locally. Uh, you commented earlier that data isn't just about the past. I wonder if you had talked about that briefly. Well, so the, the the issue when you're dealing with culture change is that data is usually, I mean, data is by its very nature about the past. And so what what happens when you use data to drive a decision to predict what is going to be um, successful uh, to determine what to choose something um, and determine through data what is the optimal choice, then you're perpetuating the past. And the the issue we're trying to address here is that these youth, um, the individuals that are currently outliers or small minorities, have not participated successfully in the past. And so, um, taking um, a concrete concrete example, say if uh, there was a competitive job application, there were a thousand applications, and the employer decides based upon data from the past, or based on data, basically, the only data they have is from the past, um, what would be the profile of a successful employee? If they do that, then what they will choose is an employee that's exactly like all of the employees that they already have. And so if you want to increase the participation of um, individuals that are currently excluded, or if you want to affect culture change within the institution, you can't use data-driven decisions. Um, so the the idea here is that we need to figure out a, a different way of um, making those types of database determinations. And one of the things that we've been looking at is combining the data of the past with data from similar groups that have made different decisions and um, simulated data. So what would happen if we, our model data, um, what would happen if we were to increase the participation of um, women within the organization or with uh, youth that have these particular um, uh, experiences and resourcefulness from uh, and uh, participating, say, in these environmental initiatives. Um, so s adding simulated data in addition to the current um, actual data. And that in that way, um, it contributes to a decision that doesn't just replicate and amplify and automate what has happened in the past. This is really, really important. Um, it's really true. Uh, that you guys is, 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 is telling now, because uh, we are working now with the guardians, uh, collecting data that the government is not collecting. For example, um, uh, 
when you come to Cartagena, Stephen, <laughs> Utah, Utah knows that uh, very well. Uh, we have a really, um, I mean, problems of education with in some neighborhoods of Cartagena. So um, frequently the people um, put the garbage in places where, where the garbage, uh, uh, where it's not uh, permitted to, to put the garbage, right? Mm -hmm. So we have um, garbage in many located in many places of the city. Uh, and this is really, uh, really bad for the city. I mean, for the health of the people and for many things. So the guardians are collecting the data uh, about where are these, uh, these garbage in the city. You can imagine 2,000 people collecting data every day uh, about, uh, in this neighborhood, we have five garbage and the, and the I mean, the, and the government is, uh, I mean, this information is available for the government to take decisions in the moment. So in the same line, they are also working, for example, where uh, with information about the dogs uh, that they see in the sea, around the city without owner or with the cats or about, uh, I mean, about different information. Um, and this information is, is now uh, available for taking decisions. So the people can do uh, collectively many things that can help uh, definitely uh, our life. And the, the other um, advantage is, is, of course, for the students. So think about a student mm -hmm. that has determined that they are stupid or that they are, I mean, that, that, that these are words that they've used, that they are worthless, et cetera. It is uh, some of the ways in which they've characterized themselves before they, they engage in this. And then all of a sudden they are doing something extremely valuable um, they are learning about a new industry that they had never, I mean, that that is an emerging industry that uh, is not generally shared within um, their education system. Um, they're at the cusp of something that's new and um, that's innovative. And so the, the sense of agency, the sense of worth, the sense of I, I can, in fact, learn and I can contribute um it is i mean i i shouldn't be saying this it should come from the, but the students but the students stories have been quite amazing um when you hear the the change in metacognition and also self-worth and and sense of of um empowerment and it it's very inspiring to some extent so how do you make this happen uh, like it's, uh, I'm sure it's not the easiest thing to go straight from, uh, you know, an environment where people don't really value diversity, like you were saying earlier, Sylvia, uh, to and an environment where educational opportunities help to attain. How do you get from there to a position where people are able to express agency? Uh, to to take control over their own learning. What what's the process? In you mean in the guardians or in general? In general, but if in you if you want to talk about the guardians specifically, maybe tell us a bit about who they are and how they came mm -hmm. to about. Yes, um, I think the war is engaged. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the most important, I mean, why the people learn? Because the people is motivated. The people is engaged, engaged, engaged in, in their own learning. Because the people know that learn have contribute for they in a better life, in be more happy. And I think that uh, this is the reason 
uh, in general, because why we, we learn? We learn to be better, we need to stay better. We, uh, we learn because we are motivated to learn. And it's, it is the, the case, for example, in, in, with the young people in, in social justice repair kit, in the young movement in social justice repair kit in many sense. Uh, for example, uh, the people go to the guardian because the guardian, the, lear, the learning, I mean, the, the learning process is real. The learning process uh, uh, that they receive in the in the guardians are impacting their life mm -hmm. because of this reason the guardians comes to the to this to the, this movement and it's is impressive because an informal learning as the environmental guardian is now recognized by the formal learning. I mean, the people go to the garden and they receive an informal and open learning process. Right. But now, as the government have a, have a, the government know the initiative, uh, as the government know the initiative works, in the public institutions, they recognize this informal learning. And the, the guardians go to the higher educational institutions for a formal learning, and they, they these institutions now recognize as a valuable credits the informal learning that the guardians are receiving. So, but what is the beginning of all of that? All of that, the engagement. And the engagement um, and the motivation of the people that uh, go to the Guardian, but also the engagement and the motivation uh, of the people that is coordinating this, uh, this, this movement. But for example, other case, we are now working with uh, a special group in Colombia that is working with, it's a young movement, and they are working with the victims of the conflict in Colombia, mm -hmm. of, with young people. So these people, because they are engaged and they are motivated, they are now creating an open educational resource for all the young, uh, young people in, in, in Colombia about the policy of John in our country. In Colombia, it's rare, but it's the reality. We don't have a policy for the John. So this is impressive, but it's the reality. And they are really a motivated John that two months ago, they didn't have an idea about what is an open educational resource. Yeah. This is crazy for, for, for us. But now they are creating an open educational resource because they are motivated. I think uh, it's, it's because of that, it's, it's motivation. I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> Yeah, and, well, the, 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 you expressed it really well. What, one thing that I certainly discovered in working with Sylvia is that there's no formulaic sort of pattern that you can um, use in different areas. So uh, personally, when I first met the Guardians, I was really surprised because they uh, were very much, um, or they, they were in, in very, very formal uniforms, almost military uniforms. <laughs> all of the the groups that I had worked with before were fairly informal and certainly sort of the antithesis to the this very, very formal uniformed all in a line um, be marching in in um, in a almost military way. And so I thought, oh, is this the right <laughs> group to be working with? But when I then talked to the, the youth, um, they 
they told me about why the uniforms are so critical and important. And it was because, oh, well, one of the reasons was because it, in order to maintain the uniforms and actually participate, it required the health help of the entire community. Many of these youth are living in housing where there's dirt floors, no running water, etc. And you have to see the immaculate condition of the uniforms that they use, not when they're doing the work in the environment, but when they meet. And in order to do that, they they um, need not just the parents, but the whole village to participate and to understand uh, and to sort of support their participation. And so it becomes um, much more uh, uh, likely that they will sustain that participation. So um, the formula or whatever, or the preconceptions that we had in, in other areas really did not hold here. Um, there's been many other sorts of lessons. So the, the lessons that we learn is that that engagement, the motivation um, can't be formulaic, it can't be sort of globally applied. Uh, it needs to uh, fit the particular scenario that the youth find themselves in or the, the students, um, whoever we're working with. And that's going to tie directly into agency, obviously. Uh, it seems to me anyways, uh, because it means that it's going to be impossible to design a program of, of uh, inclusiveness and, and uh, uh, engagement without the active participation and the control and the people who are right there and involved, the people who are actually uh, living in that particular environment. Right, yeah. And it requires, I think the, the piece of agency that that we've learned is very, very important is the opportunity to diversify. Um, the, the agency that the student has to choose their own learning outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly um, as Sylvia and I have been very much involved in personalized learning initiatives of various kinds, but all of them seem to fail to fully address the idea that you as, as a learner choose and optimize your own individualized learning outcomes. Most of them are looking at personalized uh, path and pace to uh, a, a standardized set of learning outcomes yeah. rather than uh, how do we create a diverse team of learners, each with their own unique individual contributions to um, the, the um, diversity of, of learning skills and knowledge that we need. Uh, so yeah, it, the inclusive design of programs that uh, support agency means that we, we are also talking about a choice of learning goals. So one of, one of the things you did recently, Yuda, was the uh, three dimensions of inclusive design. Can you talk about that just a bit? Sure, yeah. So um, and as I was saying, I I started the Inclusive Design Research Center about 25 years ago, and it, it, um, it grew with the web as a uh, one of our motivations for looking at inclusive design or building out this notion of inclusive design is to explore what um, affordances the digitally transformed and, and sort of complexly connected uh, sphere of, uh, or within our society of, uh, gives us with respect to people with disabilities and other people that currently are marginalized in our society. Um, there were conceptions of universal design which came out of architecture and out of industrial design. And most of those were about um, a one size fits all scaling of a more um, universally accessible design. But the affordances we had with digital systems is that um, you didn't need to say an entrance into a building, you have to think ahead um, exactly um, all of the individuals that are going to enter it and choose a design for the knob, for the entrance, for what, um, whatever, so that it, it is um, universally accessible to as many people as possible. If you're looking at a digital entrance, then you have the possibility of morphing and 
plastically presenting to each individual something that is optimized for them. Uh, the other thing is, of course, when you're networked, you don't have to redundantly produce something. You can um, collectively produce something if you maintain open li licenses and open standards. So mm -hmm. we, we um, rather than calling our center the Universal Design Center, we called it the Inclusive Design <laughs> Research Center. And um, but uh, many people, when after I had established this for some time, kept saying, well, universal design has seven principles. Um, what are the um, the principles of inclusive design? And I've never really liked listicles because it also doesn't sort of respect the notion that everybody is different, every scenario is different. And so instead, what I finally landed upon were the three dimensions of inclusive design. And uh, the idea is that th these are also not limited, it's, um, but there are, th there are three perspectives you need to take when you're designing something inclusively. The first is to recognize that everybody is unique um, and that um, we need to design rather than one size fits all. And we have the capacity and we need to design not one size fits all, but one size fits one. Mm -hmm. um, systems, um, so systems that are able to uh, stretch to the outer edges of um, what we call the, the, the scatter plot of human needs and characteristics. Um, the, the one of the images that uh, is central to sort of the three dimensions is this, um, insight that I had that if you were to take any population and you were to plot needs and characteristics that would look like a, a starburst um, where you have a, a dense set of, of um, individuals or needs and characteristics in the center, but then um, as we move away from the center, they spread further and further apart. Um, the uh, Basically, what um, I I discovered, or what you what I, I mean, I uh, in working more and more with um, scatter plots, is that the uh, dots in the center are very close together, meaning that they're very similar. But as you move further and further from the edge, they become more and more different from each other. But the approach that we've taken to accessibility and universal design seems to assume that we can create a scalable solution for individuals that are small minorities or outliers, and that that isn't the case. So um, we need to recognize that everybody's unique. We need to work on a one-size-fits-one approach. We need to not do it in a segregated but an integrated way, especially in the digital sphere because the biggest barrier to participation in the digital sphere for people with disabilities is that is interoperability. If we create a segregated industry, then mm -hmm. the, the, all of the systems that people with disabilities depend upon are um, lose their interoperability. They, they also increase in cost because specialized costs more. Um, and th there's numerous other reasons why it has to be integrated. And then lastly, uh, for that first dimension, uh, what when we're looking at data, we need to use that data to make the individual, the learner smarter, as well as the system smarter. So self-determination, uh, metacognition agency with respect to the story, the narrative that is there about you. Um, this, so that's the first dimension. The second dimension <laughs> is um, that we need to um, create a process that is inclusive. So uh, one of the assumptions within the, the current field is that um, individuals who are currently excluded are largely consumers of information. They're not producers. Right. Um, we and often we in, in equity and inclusion initiatives we invite people to the table but the table has never been designed for them so it's equi equitable access to a table that doesn't work for you and so we need to um, ensure that the processes we're using for design are going to be um, inclusively built and continuously ask Who's missing and and at the in the design process have as many um, a, a greatest diversity of perspectives as possible um, because if you I mean this this follows sort of Scott Page's uh, 
discovery that uh, ability um, or diversity trumps ability that, that he did right. that before Trump came in. But the, <laughs> the idea is if you have a table of um, the best and the brightest and a table of uh, the most diverse perspectives, the most diverse perspectives will be the most creative, will um, is more likely to address, be able to address a complex uh, problem, etc. I mean, there are all sorts of benefits to having diverse perspectives. The so that's the second dimension. The third dimension mm -hmm. is to recognize that we're working within complex adaptive systems. So um, no design decision is made in isolation. For example, if we were to design a curriculum that works for a particular student, if we don't then also think about the teacher and how they're going to implement that and what the implications are for the teacher, then that particular so, uh, solution or, or approach is not going to survive. If we then also don't think about the principal, if we don't think about the school board, if we don't think about et cetera, wherever we've not considered the, the repercussions or the ripple effects of a design decision, there's gonna be a friction point and it will break down. The, the good lesson in that is that um, we can we can create or turn around vicious cycles into virtuous cycles by thinking about uh, using a systems thinking approach as to where our intervention will happen. So those are the three the three dimensions of inclusive design. And of course, there's lots of ways in which we've applied them in the education sphere. So, and and clearly these have been applied as well in the social justice repair kit. And, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and so it all comes back around. Uh, it, it's it's interesting, and uh, you know, I was uh, certainly very influenced when I was in Medellin, listening to the uh, survivors of the conflict, violence, and hearing about their experiences, and especially what it was that uh, war took away from them. Uh, it took away their security, obviously, but also their identity, and then the things that the two of you are talking about here, the, the, their individual voice, uh, you know, their, their capacity to be different and distinct, and as well, the opportunities, uh, you know, conflict takes away any possibility of opportunity. Do you see a linkage between design and agency and opportunity? Uh, for both these, uh, you know, the, the victims of violence, but for society in general? Yes, <laughs> most definitely. We, um, and I'll let, I, I think Sylvia will have the most to say in this area because she's most familiar, but what, one of the, the parts of the second dimension is we always talk about nothing. There's a mantra in the disability community called uh, that says nothing about us without us mm -hmm. um, and everything is about us basically <laughs> is the second piece of that um, so the the idea yeah. is that um, the individuals that are most impacted and if you are at at the margins or if you're at the edge you are most vulnerable to the uh, the um, risks and um, issues that are there uh, to some extent the people that are at the edge or at the margins are like the canaries in the coal mine they are the ones that are the the they pre um, they give us a warning signal of what will have an impact on society as a whole and so the um, there are benefits to thinking about and looking at the security identity voice and opportunity of those individuals at the margins um, in all design because it mm that leads to a better um, sort of risk prediction um, precursor or uh, um, of what will happen to society as a whole. So it's, it's extremely valuable in design. Um, the, one of the objections that's frequently made in, in to inclusive design is doesn't it cost more? But in fact, um, it's far more cost effective if we're concerned about the long term and if we're looking at the longevity of the design that we create. It's also, in terms of the process, less costly because with only a few people participating, you you have a, a much greater diversity of perspectives. So what's, what Scott Page calls the diversity quotient or um, the, the diversity benefit is achieved much more quickly 
when you engage individuals that are um, at the margins of our society. Is this, this point is impressive for us. Um, I want to talk about two things. In the case of social justice repair kit, for example, everything was, uh, was done with the people. Anything without the people. Uh, the guardians uh, actively participate in, in the creation of your web page and different things. And, and also the stories. The stories were created by, by the people, also by the people in a co-creation process. But I think the most important thing is uh, what is happening with the Colombian society in this moment. Mm, we, mm, many people in, in our country have fear because of the violence. We are living in a violence and bi violent environment from 60 years ago. So for us it's normal to, to do silent, is correct to do silent or, or be silent. And I think that one of the most important things that we need to work on is uh, definitely in the participation of the community in the creation or in the visualization of the future. Because we don't need in this moment an impulse future. We need to create the future in peace that we want to have in the future. So, and that is, I mean, the situation in, is not only from, uh, from Colombia. It's also, it's a situation that uh, are living our partners in Venezuela and in many countries in Central America and in many other countries now in uh, in Latin America, uh, where now are go difficult, or I mean, I don't know how to say that difficult government <laughs> <laughs> in this moment. But I think that people need to need to express their opinion, and this is the moment to express the opinion and to embrace a culture of diversity. I mean, I think as Colombia, we need to talk about what is happening in our country, why is uh, the diversity is a value and not a problem, because we need to, as Yuta said, we need to hear different voices to, to take the best option for all of all of us. So uh, I think Stephen, we, we have really big challenge in all Latin America uh, and we need to deal every day with this challenge. And the most important challenge is to embrace this dimension of the inclusive uh, <laughs> design in our life. We need to recognize from ourselves, the diversity as a value. We need to um, not think about uh, the person or the other person and, and the diverse opinion of the person as a problem, but as a, a really value for us. And we need to, uh, this mentality, this, uh, this reality, we need to, to do things to impact uh, this problematic government or, or this uh, hostile 
situation in, in all of our countries. I think it's, it's really important. And I think that the cooperation in this moment uh, is really important for, for us, for all of us. <laughs> Yes, I think these are issues that are faced not only in Latin America, but here in North America as well, and, and around the world. And uh, the sorts of things that you raise here, uh, these are the sorts of considerations that we need that we need to raise when we think about living in a global community in a global environment. Uh, Sylvia, Yuta, I want to thank you very much for joining me in this session, in this final session of eLearning 3.0. Uh, I think you wrapped it up beautifully. And I don't want to add anything more to that. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we certainly appreciate your, your presence and sharing your, your perspective with us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you, Sylvia. So that concludes this uh, last conversation in Eulern 3.0. We'll probably have a get together, a graduation ceremony, if you will, an online confab, completely disorganized and messy. I don't even know when it is yet. Um, to, to wrap up the course, the course itself officially finishes this Friday. Um, there will be badges, PA, it all works. And uh, um, we will be celebrating. So thank you very much. Thank all of you for joining us. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you, Sylvia. And this is uh, Stephen Downs signing off for another day. <laughs>